people weren't afraid to speak their mind because they were afraid of the consequences of what would happen if they did. Because some organization is, I pay you to work, I don't pay you to think. And I clearly don't pay you to challenge me in front of the team. Those are difficult organizations to succeed. How can you rapidly scale your business through strategic acquisitions? In today's episode of the Scaling Fast Lane, serial entrepreneur Tom Shipley reveals his proven tactics for using mergers and acquisitions to ignite hyper growth. You'll hear inside stories of how Tom repeatedly leveraged acquisitions to catapult his companies to industry leadership positions. Listen in and learn the framework behind his track record of building, scaling, and exiting companies in record time you'll find interesting is how much we talk about culture and people and what it takes to lead and understand that the other side, we're not talking about this. Joe started in the agency world. She ran one of the most prestigious, she was a managing director and ran one of the most several, but really one of the most prestigious agencies in London. So she understands KPIs, OKRs, how to do it, how to deliver incredible client um, products, consistent processes, how to get the most of creative teams. But ultimately, as leaders, we have to go back to what are the biggest points of leverage that we have. And that's why we talk about this. If you haven't read Red Uncle Candor, it's one of what I consider for CEOs must do. I can tell you what the problem my organizations that I have in the past is people weren't afraid to speak their mind because they were afraid of the consequences of what would happen if they did. Because some organization is, I pay you to th work, I don't pay you to think. And I clearly don't pay you to challenge me in front of the team. Okay, those are difficult organizations to succeed. But the, my problem in my organizations was that people cared and loved each other too much. They were afraid to speak the truth because they didn't want to embarrass or humiliate people. And changing the culture, especially when you create this really trusting core team, changing the culture where people understand that if they don't speak directly and have what we call sincere candor versus radical candor, Again, so people don't misinterpret and be very direct and clear what you really mean is you are doing a disservice to that person, that individual. You are doing disservice for the organization and you can ultimately by that philosophy and that culture, you can take the company down. And changing that philosophy is what we have to do. So that's one book. The other book that we make mandatory and we talk about this in our retreats is Five Dysfunctions a Team. It's an old book, it's been around a while but we still use it, we still make it mandatory and we still talk about it because those behaviors come up and if your team doesn't know how to ad address those, you'll end up knowing those problems. And understand this, that I love, as, as Josh knows, I love marketing like nothing else. I love to identify ways to grow organically and finding force multipliers to grow. I was able to take my company from, increase their EBITDA over six months by $1.2 million a month profit by this, by the team working together and some of the marketing strategies, which I love to talk about. But ultimately, we look for the force multipliers. Who here knows what a force multiplier is? In the military, I'll give a great example. In the military, what are some great force multipliers? If I was a small special forces group in the military and I had the advantage of one is GPS and maps, so I know where I am, great comm equipment, so I know where it is, Long, um, great sights on my on my, on my gear so I can actually see, but you can do it uh, drones so I can see exactly what's with infrared so I can see what's going around me. How many troops with no technologies would it take to defeat my small, highly trained team? That's highly trained. So those technology can be force multipliers. So in business, what can give us leverage, okay? And that's part of what we're doing today is culture, and if we don't beat it too much to death, is a force multiplier in your organization, period. Because a trusting team with great communication, they're clear. There is a company that someone who's related to me, fiance, worked for for a nanosecond. It was one of the most highly talked about unicorns in Silicon Valley, highly funded. It is that multi-billion dollar unicorn that when he went there, he lasted two weeks there because it was the most toxic culture he's ever seen in his life. And Fast forward six months, they're talking about that business with unique technology, competitive advantage, like no one's ever seen, and over what was a several billion dollar valuation is going down. Why? Because people are leaving there like nothing else because of the toxic culture. That's why, give me a great team and we can create anything great from scratch. And what Peter's talking about today and what we're talking today is 
how to leverage acquisitions. And let me just share a story is, and it's a true story. <laughs> Um, I started a company in 1999 and started with nothing. And I went out and painstakingly, I didn't know how to raise money. So I went and raised between ten dollars and $50,000 from 65 individuals, high net worth individuals. But again, it was my first shot at raising money, but it gave me a C capital. And I was growing my first business, my first omni-channel business, which was really great. And then we hit a wall because the dot-com bust. Okay, we hit a clear wall there and we couldn't raise any money because no one was raising money. And then an investment banker called me up and said, I have a division of Boise Cascade that's selling off a division. And basically they were, again, multi-billion, it was a $15 million business they didn't care about. The deal we were able to negotiate allowed me to bring in investors because now I wasn't just raising money for my business. I was doing an acquisition, allowed me to bring in outside investors. And I was able to negotiate a deal where basically I brought in investors, we paid them a million dollar in cash, but because the way we structured it and they had all this media they prepaid for, and you understand prepaid media, they just dropped mass amounts of catalogs and every type of advertising. We didn't do anything for 60 days. And with the orders that came in the next 60 days, we made over a million dollars. It paid the money back like that, the cash like that. So again, uh, that's an example of how acquisition solved a lot of issue, growth, scaled, as well as it allowed us to raise more money and, and solve that issue. Fast forward five years, my partner and I had this brilliant idea. Two former special forces guys said, well, the skincare business is great, it's growing, the demand is incredible, and my thesis at the time was no one's ever used direct response effectively to build iconic beauty brands. We told it could not be done, and we said we're going to prove you wrong, and after going all in financially, and we're talking when we say all in, uh, credit cards, mortgages, our 401ks, everything in, at the end of a year, we had a slight loss and I had a three, uh, $338,000 company in Richmond, Virginia. It was myself, my partner, and we had good data to show that we could scale this. But that's what we had and we were done. We were wiped out. And we brought a client on in Hoboken, New Jersey and did um, Urban Nutrition, $15 million business, doing a million and a half dollars of profit. And by two young people that started the business five, five years before, and it was a great little business with 15 products purely online. But when we visited them and we, they were paying us to consult with them how to take their business offline. And it was helping us pay some of our bills, which was for some reason stressing my wife out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so we walked in there and when we first met them and they have an incredible businesses. They had shipping out 10,000 orders out of the kitchen. The next floor up, they had their programmers. The next floor up, they had their accounting team. Over here in the next townhouse over on the bottom floor, they had their customer service people answering phones and responding to email. And again, you had this and they lived on the third floor. And this is great little boutique business and we joked that they were so efficient and they had their own CRM they built from scratch and this infrastructure and back then there wasn't click funnels there was nothing as 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 funnel sites that you can just plug and play they had their own technology and their whole microsites platform that was easy replicatable and we said we either want to buy you we're joking because we had nothing or we want to build a company like you over the next two years and then we said that and they said let's talk we negotiated a deal to buy their business for two and a half times even. Remember, we had nothing. And I, what could you, we have a company that's barely break even, that's a startup a year old. So we went out to raise money. We found a broker that specialized in mezzanine level financing. What's mezzanine financing? Mezzanine is, it doesn't mean debt from a bank. It doesn't mean pure equity. It's companies that make most of their money from high interest, plus they get a little bit of a kicker for 5% warrants in your business. Okay, gladly, if we can borrow the money to buy this, I'll gladly away 5% of my company. And that's what we did is we went out, found a company, brought someone in to finance us. And because we bought this business, it gave us the platform, products, technologies, and a team that we took our hydroxytone brand. And within two years, we did 125 million in revenue. Without the platform and that cash flow, I don't know what would happen. I like to think we would have found a way. Acquisitions, so when you say I don't, it's not about resources. We didn't have any resources. It's about resourcefulness, how you do it. But acquisitions can solve, again, is an absolute force multiplier. I'm just gonna stay here because I don't wanna forget it is. I view it as your right as entrepreneurs, if you haven't had so already, to have at least three exits in your lifetime. The question is, is how can you think in advance, understand I'm gonna have three exits in my lifetime, what are your non-negotiables? It could be, I want to have positive impact. It could be, I want to have fun along the way. It could be, I want to have a win behind my back while I'm doing it. It could be, I want to spend time with my family. It could be, I want to surround myself with people that I really enjoy and I love. 
The question is, is then if you had that vision, how do you architect and how do you architect that? And what we're trying to share with, there's ways to do it within your team and organic growth, but then how do you do it with acquisitions that basically is your ultimate force multiplier or leverage to shortcut time? Because I don't know about you, but I'm trying to always compress time. Different ways of force multipliers. I talked about one culture, two is acquisitions that I used in T. Shipley and also Atlantic Coast uh, Media Group. The next thing I do is I spend, I also do intense learning. I look for what is it, because I can either do several things is, I can't tell you, I spent, we did $2 billion in revenue, which means that we had expenses of close to that, which what meant is I had access to the best consultants, teams while we're building it, vendors, testing, mistakes along the way, errors, and over 15 years, I learned a shit ton. But the question is, is do we have to spend so much money to do that? Could we have been drastically more profitable and had an easier time growing through what would have made it easier? And first of all, intense learning. I made a mistake. I went to only industry functions for a period of time and that was my investment. And most of it was business development. I stopped investing in myself. I stopped doing intense courses and intense learning in a lot of different areas. And I'm going to say it was just six years ago when I woke up, I said, shit, my skills are getting weak. So let me go intense learning and rebuild my scale skills, which then I'll tell you later why it was the key for me going and switching on an incremental $1.2 million monthly profit into the business. The next thing that enabled, and I'll share a little story later about they go together about that same period of time. I realized that I had gotten comfortable with my network. And I forgot that early in my career, my whole leverage was your network is your net worth, which is not your cheap, how many Facebook friends and LinkedIn friends do I have, okay? LinkedIn content, this is bullshit. The question is, people that will take your call and give you time and actually give a shit about you and help you out along the way because when things are great, they are your leverage point to get to the next level, as well as when things are challenging, they are your lifelines. And most of your networks and your problems can, your issues can be solved through acquisitions and your network. And having a group of people that you trust, that you consistently get together, that are smart, that can challenge you, that surround you with people. And I've seen this over and over again. For me, it was how I got met quarter people in the room through masterminds that I've enrolled in. Why? Because compressed time, I either earn my way into networks or I pay my way into networks. If I pay my way to be surrounded by the right people that are having, it's not just in a cocktail party, I'm hanging out with people. It's the right people in the right rooms that is where it's being curated in such a way that the right dialogues were with, this is what I need in my life right now. And that's what I have invested in at the right time. And I'm always asking the question, I still ask the question even today is, what room should I be into? Can I either walk into that room through just what I either can give through relationships or what room do I pay to get into that creates curates that environment that will give me exponential growth and make my life easier. And besides, as I said, two years ago, I think I said this two years ago, the biggest decision I made, one of them was that I want to be surrounded with people in my life that give me energy and people that don't give me energy. I hate to say this. I just don't have time for my life is too short. If people are giving me energy, I'm learning, I'm growing. I want people that are hungry to grow and hungry to learn and hungry to care and hungry to have impact. If not, there are billions of people in the world that they can hang out with and that's okay. But I know that if I can do this and I find people like Peter, Felix, Holly that really want to change the world and that have that energy and passion is, my God, this, this ride has been great. So this afternoon, um, we're going to hear a lot more about scaling and your organizations and Felix is, I want you to go deep as Felix starts sharing his frameworks for 2i3x and understand that there is the techniques and the strategy map that he's going to share with you. There's also the environment that they create by creating this changing your tactically thinking team, which they're tactically most of them, how to change them in strategic thinkers and the psychology behind what they're evolving your team to do. Which again, the question we say is, my team, how can I get them to stop thinking about that their role is this and think of even level, do a great job in their day job, but their night job, my joke at night is certainly not their night job, but they're also can think strategically so you're not alone. So 
Um, excited about that. What we're not going to have a chance to cover, and this I'll do a little bit of framework on it. There's a whole framework that we create here within AVA that we've created that allows us to do acquisitions at speed. It has to do with our financial plans. It has to do with our onboarding. It has to do with the integration. It has to do with how we actually bring aboard the teams and it's also the financing components because I mentioned mezzanine, I mentioned individual investors. Um, we can talk about at some point how we actually raise the money for Foundry. I did for private equity, I raised $100 million. It comes with strings attached and sharp elbows which are challenging in early stage companies and startups versus what we're doing here which is totally different way of financing and structuring. But we can, I can more than happy to share ideas. Um, if you want to today is at lunch today, encourage you to meet each other, talk to each other. Um, we're going to be around, talk to us at lunch. Joe's going to be along. Unfortunately, Joe's going to fly out tonight. Are you still flying out tonight? Yes. Crushing us, okay? <laughs> okay, chat with her. And then if you do end up, we will talk to you about the opportunity to join us long-term for our consistent mastermind then. If you decide to do that, you'll have access to Joe and our team one-on-one. -on -one. Anyways, I appreciate it. Enjoy lunch. Thanks for listening to the Scaling Fastlane podcast. If you enjoyed this content and are looking for a more immersive experience, join us at the next Scale at Speed live event. It's packed with dynamic content, expert insights, and a room full of like-minded, action-oriented agency leaders. Come elevate your scaling journey in person. Visit scaleatspeedlive.com to ensure your spot today. We can't wait to see you there.